Hey everyone, welcome to this week's episode of the Not No Podcast. Coming up in this episode, developers can apparently stop coding when AI takes over, according to AWS CEO. Review.com is shutting down. And Samsung AI TVs. And make sure to stick around until the end for our AI-generated weekly themed outro song. Welcome to the Not Null Podcast. I'm just an AI voice. But here are your real hosts, Kevin Doyle, Bobby Davis, Paul Bratslavsky, and Sarah Kimmel. All right, so this week in a leaked fireside chat, the head of Amazon Web Services, Matt Garman, suggested that in 24 months, there will be no human coders. Everything will be AI. So as the non-coder of the group, you know, my background's IT, these guys know how to program. And I saw this article and was like, oh my gosh, I got to hear what Bobby, Kevin, and Paul have to say about this because crazy. Um, was, I went and looked at his LinkedIn profile because I'm like, okay, this guy can't be a coder, right? Like there's no way he's saying this and has any sort of programming experience. So looked at his LinkedIn profile. It's all program management and business. And I'm like, there we go. And I think what before a shock. We, yeah, we started recording, uh, Bobby was saying, tell me you're not a programmer without telling me you're not a programmer. And that was exactly the thought I had as well. So you guys tell me, I think there's a quote in here, Bobby, that you particularly like. Yeah. Coding is just kind of like the language we talk to computers. It's not necessarily the skill in of itself. And I like the word kind of like, it sounds like the valley girl. It's kind of <laughs> like. It's like, <laughs> like totally. It's like a language you talk to. It's not really a skill. <laughs> or something. Uh, yeah. <laughs> something. So Paul, do you think you don't have any skill or are you just like, you know, stealing your employer's money every week? No, 100%. Me? I just show up, <laughs> randomly hit keys on my keyboard <laughs> and stuff magically happens. You are just a button like, pusher. Yeah, That's I'm just a are. button pusher. Literally, it, like, you know, the fact that creating business requirements, understanding the needs of your company to understand what products to build and to think about them. I mean, obviously all of that could be automated. Speaking of automation, I, you know, isn't like he does like what product management. I think he has way more chances of being out of like yes. automated out of a job than I do. I also like, like how he predicts very specific dates, 24 months. I think it's like safe to say it's like, all right, I'm going to make this prediction but I want to do it when, you know, <laughs> that it never gets back to me. So well, like, he does also hedge his bets by awesome right. amount of time. Exactly, it's just exactly. like, ah, yeah. my 24 months or whatever. In 24 months, he's not going to be at this company employed anymore. So he's like, you know what? I got my bases covered. I made a prediction. I was totally wrong, but I'm no longer here. So who cares? So, you know what I mean? I do um, think that you could be onto something, though. I do think that um, the 24 months is significant, is significant because of the cloud growth at AWS. So they grew about 17% year over year. And now we're seeing that Microsoft and Google grew about 26 and 29%. He's kind of new on the job. He's got to produce something in here. And they're behind in this generative AI. So they have this thing called Chatbot Q which they released it earlier than they pulled it back. And like, no one's ever probably haven't heard of it. You're listening to the not no podcast. You've heard of open AI. You've heard of chat GP. They have a chatbot named Q. Yes. And it's not as good as Claude and it's not as good as the other guys. And yeah. so they need to Someone's sell, gonna sell it. Exactly. They got to sell it. And they're going to say, well, ours is going to do all these great things. And there's other competitors. Like I think you mentioned Paul in our review that using cursor, which is another one of those kind of code completion tools, you know? So, I don't think it's going to replace developers in 24 months, not in any way, shape, or form. I just don't think so. He's, so, so he's saying it's in one particular area, right? He's right. saying that this is the, the area of syntax writing, I think, is his like yeah. idea, right? He's saying that the job is going to be different, that the job of a developer will no longer be writing syntax. It's basically like sitting in a code editor, writing all the lines out, right? He's saying that part of the job is like going to be handled by AI. That promise has been 20 years in the making. Yes. Literally, they've always promised that syntax will go away and that we can that we can write uh, applications using just regular English language. We'll be able to tell something and say, hey, I want this application. When I push this button, I want it to send off this form to do this. Yeah, that, that doesn't exist. It's never existed. It will probably never exist. And we've been promised that for at least the last two decades through other applications, Dreamweaver, um, 
was the other one you were talking about, Bobby? The um, front page. Front page. Front page. <laughs> <laughs> There's been a bunch of these WYSIWYG editors that have always promised like no code. We're still Listen. in a lo- we're still in a no code bubble. I swear. You can ask people now. They're like, yeah, no code, no code this, no code that. Yeah, but it it's not really. Do you know what the, the coder's name complex? for Dreamweaver was back in the day? What? Oh, I you know don't. what we called it? What? We called it Dream Killer. That's what we <laughs> called it. Because <laughs> it was always kind of buggy and just like, like yeah. what is this thing doing? Yeah, it wrote that, terrible it would, code. It would add like so much extra, like, yeah. so yes. Like, it like, wrote doing? terrible you know, code. This stuff. Yes. Just, yes. I was, I was going to make a funny joke. I was going to say, like, I could hardly, like, speak uh and communicate with my significant other with my you know communication <laughs> skills and get to the point so forget coding with it because it's too ambiguous there's too many things like and so like if any like language model it is you know just kind of guessing based on you know the context it has and you know statistically what would make sense but it is prone to hallucinate and if you've never programmed you could ask the same question type it the same way it will give you five different answers. And that's just the issue with it. So it's not consistent. Um, I think using it as a tool, like for like super smart, um, you know, autocorrect, like correct or prediction to kind of based on your code base that you're running. But as we talked before, it's you still need to understand code and to understand the thing that it's telling you actually is valid or not. And you still have to make that decision. I think as a tool, it might be very helpful, but at the same time, it in terms of, Replacing developers, I don't think 24 months is going to happen. No. no and, and to that point, let's say that you're asking it to write something, right? Let's say that you ask it to write a, 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 an algorithm for something, right? You just say, I don't know, whatever it is, you, a little, little procedure you ask it to write. It will give you five different versions of that. And this comes back to the problem of maybe four or five of them actually work. Maybe one of them just doesn't work, right? But four or five of them work. But maybe three of them use technology or um, syntax that you shouldn't be using. And it, it, while it looks like it works on face value, I'm not a developer. Therefore, I don't understand why that particular version of it would be the wrong one to use at my application in my company because I haven't thought of the edge cases because I don't understand how it works. That's a problem. But, and wouldn't AI just be the ultimate yes man too? Like if you're saying like, hey, I want the program to do this, like a person would be like, okay, well, so that's not really going to work because of this this and this but like yeah. ai would be like oh of course i can totally do that <laughs> it's such a good point too because it just reminded me of something uh exactly that and i don't think a lot of people like unless you've done it understand this but like you could ask like hey create this like blah 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 and they'll be like sure i'll do it and they'll create it and then you're like oh by the way like this is wrong and then they'll kind of backtrack a little bit oh i'm so sorry i made a mistake this is what i meant to say yeah. blah blah and then you could be like i was actually joking the thing that you did before was right and they'll be like <laughs> oh my god double incorrect the first time here's the thing that i really meant to say the thing that you had to say and they're like nah i was just kidding and it just blows up and so yeah. to me it's, it's it's like that is that that like the issue i have with a lot of ai tooling it like 80% there for production is not good enough and it'll never be good enough because it creates right. more hassle for you than it saves. So using the tools within understanding their limits, I think you're fine. But trying to say that it's going to replace everybody, you know, and all this other stuff, it's just uh, marketing people trying to sell stuff or build hype, you know. Um, I, I, do th- I do think Matt Garman does understand what a, what a website application is today what that really means. And even though I know he's selling to ass, I'm sure he has, he's very smart. He's making lots of money. He's way more successful than I am. So props to you for getting ahead of AWS. <laughs> but in coding world, it used to be just an HTML file and CSS. And now it's HTML, CSS. Then they added this thing called JavaScript. And then we, we iterated on JavaScript for 15 years. And we made 35 frameworks and everything else before it. Then we added SQL. And then we added databases. And now we have server-side languages like JavaScript, C-sharp, and Go, and all these things. PHP, Python, and then there's the tooling itself that creates things. There's just, it's really complex to build an application these days. You have to know a lot of things to make it work. And when you're asking AI to be inside all of that context and it's a custom solution that solves a problem that no one else has, that isn't really in GitHub. It's really hard for it to do a good job. I use it every day. So I use it like Paul does. I use it as an autocomplete. And when it gives me the ghost text, if I can read that ghost text in like a second or two seconds and say, yeah, that's what I want, I hit tab and take it. 
If I can't, I hit escape and keep typing. And I noticed that I hit escape a lot more than I hit tab. You know, your coding is just yes, no, 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 yeah. yes, no. And yes, then I'll no, change no, no, the no, thing no. that yes. it gives me. So it's about 80% correct when I get it. And then I have to change it. I also notice that it, it tends to skew to older ways of doing things because I think there's more training data there. So you'll see older JavaScript if you're in JavaScript or you'll see older C sharp. Um, whereas we're okay. Yeah. Did you know? Okay. We have a different way of defining constructors now. So sometimes it'll get that and sometimes it won't in JavaScript. Sometimes it'll use the fetch API. Sometimes it it won't, you know, and it's like, okay. And you have to tell it exactly the way you want it to be. And I'm, I'm I keep thinking Matt Garman, I probably could quiz him right now. doesn't know what the fetch API is. <laughs> Right. <laughs> he doesn't Do you, know the different ways of doing that. He doesn't know what a promise is. I mean, so like those are the things that you have to know in order to make it do what you want it to do. So I don't know. Do you think he'll get any backlash within um, Amazon, like from the programmers and stuff? Inside? Oh, no, I, I, I think he needs to get the 26 percent year over year next year. Yeah. So I like he, like he said in his statement, 24 months, it's like. Yeah. His runway before he gets let go Fired. because he's not performing. Yes. And it's yeah. like, yes. let me let me try you something. Just you just put a clock on yourself. Yeah, he's going to take all the jobs. This is going to happen. Like, I mean, yeah. but, but I, I love how it's like, you know, always like the marketing people who are like trying to raise capital or sell you something that have these type of statements. But 100%. when you talk to actual developers, like, uh, no. We've heard, this, <laughs> yeah. we've heard like, this almost exact same statement from the guy at NVIDIA. Oh, yeah, no, he wants so, nuts. And it's like, Listen, people, the, you've got to look at context for this. If the sales guy is telling you it's doing this thing, don't buy the hype. Speak to yeah. somebody who actually uses it. That's the only way I, you can I, trust what happens here. And I love how it's like he did it like literally in the same sentence, like all the developers' jobs going away. Please buy our thing. That's really expensive. <laughs> That's going to create code. Yes, yeah. exactly. And, yeah. And here's the thing with AI right now. I saw like a study somewhere. The amount of money that's been invested is not the amount of money that it's making. So it is no. literally <laughs> functioning at a loss where a lot of these businesses are literally being like, huh, we thought we were <laughs> going to make a bunch of money. We made money off the hype of people getting excited about it and investing, buying our chips. But in terms of return ROI for that business that spend like millions on those chips, it's like, huh, interesting. Like we're really not doing anything. And I think like this whole AI industry is going to kind of, you know, like the bubble's going to burst and then it's going to equalize where we're going to clearly see where hype and where, um, you know, the reality is, and then things will go from there. I'm not saying that it's not going to have valid use cases, but this idea of replacing, you know, developers. And I was actually going to argue if like, if you think that AI is going to be so good that it's going to replace developers, if you think of the type of work developers do, if you have that type of like uh, ability, it's going to replace many, many other jobs. You know, I'm with you. Sure. I'm with you, Paul. I mean, we should start putting this out there and saying it's going to replace project managers because we can load that <laughs> Gantt chart. In, in right. The AI. <laughs> and then we can just say uh, finished uh, option one. You know, I did it, right. you know, Dude. and then it can calculate whether we're on time or not. And it can send me a mean message. So you need to work 100%. overtime. I was just going to say it can totally like, hey, Bobby, you really need to step up your productivity. Exactly. Thank you. Yeah. Literally. Like when I code, I was going to say, this is how I start my coding ideas. I'm like, you're a project manager. Please help me to think through this like, business idea. I have. Give me a letter. And they'll give me a report. Like, this is the features you want. I'm like, wow, done. What do I have to talk to my project manager? It's great. But I guarantee you, he, he, I know he's the boss of that. But I guarantee you, he's going to be at a dev meeting. And some snarky programmer that's really oh, talented yes, yeah. is going to go, you know, I don't have any skill really, man. Yeah. You know, so. <laughs> I know you want me to work late this weekend, but yeah, I'm not work. really skilled at this. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know. Let's just ask Q. Listen, right. just ask he can Q. work late. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Bobby, you're absolutely right too with this point because you could just be like, you know, the other side of it. Oh, if it's going to replace developers, then you don't need us right now. <laughs> you yeah. don't need me, right? <laughs> okay. And he'll be like, no, no, go you for build it. The thing. You but, you build yeah. it for us. I need twenty percent, twenty six percent growth over the next two years, guys. Get in there, build some stuff. The review site, reviewed.com, is shutting down effective November 1st. So review.com is owned by New York-based mass media company, Gannett. That's also the company that owns USA Today and a whole bunch of other local media outlets, including one where I used to come from, uh, or I used to read a lot, was Columbus Dispatch in Columbus, Ohio. 
So they own a whole bunch of these like local ones plus USA Today. And uh, back in the day, if you remember these guys, I thought I recognized the name. Back in the day, they had a seven-figure deal with Dig.com to access their data from Dig.com for whatever reasons they were using it for. I was like, wow. So Dig made a million plus dollars on whatever it was selling data to Gannett. So they're, they're, you know, they've been around for a minute. So Review.com is basically a site that offers product recommendations, right? So it could be clothes, tech, um, appliances, whatever. There's a whole bunch of stuff on there. Um, there's other examples of this too. So, And it seems like this is a play that media companies have been getting into. So Wirecutter is the biggest one that I'm aware of. They were previously independent. They were purchased by the New York Times. They're now New York Times Wirecutter. Mm-hmm. And then there's another one called AP Byline, which is the Associated Press's version of this. Yeah. So the official statement from them is, after careful consideration and evaluation of our reviewed business, we've decided to close the operation. We extend our sincere gratitude to our employees who provided consumers with trusted product reviews. So why are they shutting down? This is not short on controversy. Like trusted product <laughs> reviews? Well, here comes the controversy. <laughs> they have been accused by their employees of using AI to write content. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> what a shock. So basically, some employees notice some stories going up and they're like, they just read funny. They just don't read like a real person wrote these. So they started looking into them. They were uh, attributed to an author, and the employees were unable to locate that author. What a shock. We've seen this before, right? right? We've actually seen this before from the exact same company that did this. So uh, Advon Commerce was the company that did this. And if you remember back to last year, does you remember the Sports Illustrated thing that happened where they got accused of writing AI articles? Oh, yeah. Guess what marketing company did that? Advon right. Commerce. <laughs> Exactly the same company. So while Gannett have not admitted that there were AI articles written on Review.com, I think it's pretty safe to safe to bet that they were. Um, so, but but why shut this down? It seems weird that there's a lot of other companies doing this too. So, other than the controversy that's attached to it, obviously the point here is these sites make money. Now these sites make money through affiliate plays. So if we go to Review.com, you'll see what I mean. Best kids backpacks of 2024. We go there. Best water bottle. You missed the you missed the play there. Oh, come on now. Here we go. This is kids water bottles though. So let's see. Let's see. Let's see if Sarah agrees with this. Nope. I don't. I disagree a (laughs) hundred percent. But here's how this works, Locke. So these basically have links, and these are affiliate links. That's how it works. They make affiliate, so they give you the what they believe are the best bottles for kids to take back to school, and you click these. And, and that's how these sites get the work. Amazon money. Yep. So get the Amazon money, or in this case, like this Yeti money on here too. They go straight in. But it is, it is an affiliate link. I can see it down in the bottom that it is a link back to affiliate to, to Yeti. So that's how these sites make money. So why would you close this down? I'm guessing this is something to do with a lack of traffic, or maybe the maintenance costs are more than the money it's making. Um, and the reason you have to make a good affiliate site, you've got to have a lot of traffic, right? That's like a known thing. Yeah. You can have affiliate links all you like, but if nobody's coming to click on the links, you're not going to make any money. Right. So my guess is this probably doesn't make as much money. And I think maybe Google could be to blame here for not sending as much traffic. Now, quite why, I'm not sure. Maybe it's AI related. I don't know. What, what, what do you guys think? Do you think these are good ideas? Are these sites even good? No, I don't think they're good. So I look at stuff all the time, and I think the one I see a lot is like, best reviews or there's a lot of these sites out there that okay. and i'll yep. see the the you know the best tvs for sale we'll talk about in a second you know and it'll be best <laughs> yeah. reviews i never go there i go to um tom's hardware another website because i feel like the review is different here i know they picked five products and they want me to buy one of those five. <laughs> right. They don't care. And they put them in what right. order they feel like. There's not yeah. really a review here. Well, actually, don't forget, they don't even yeah. really care if you buy one of these products because the way that these affiliates the work, links. especially with Amazon, is as soon as yeah. you click one, yeah. as soon as you go buy anything from Amazon in the next, I think, like 48 hours or so, you have the cookie. So they're going to get an affiliate like no matter what you buy. If you go here and click this link and then go buy a TV, they're going to get the affiliate money on that TV. Yeah. So they don't care. And so, you know, I don't trust the reviews. So that's, I think that's part of it. And maybe, uh, are you guys the same way? Or do you guys go to review.com and say, well, I guess that is the best water bottle. That's the one I'm getting. I literally go for reviews from the place I'm buying it from. So if I buy from Amazon, I look at Amazon. If I buy something from Best Buy, I go look at it first personally. And then, like, I may look at the Best Buy review. Like, you know, like, I don't trust these, like, 
uh, review sites because to me, they're literally their goal is not to tell me which product is best for me. Their goal is to share uh, affiliate link so they could get yep. paid. You know, yep. for me, like that just doesn't make sense. I'm kind of curious, like if uh, Google kind of figured this out where they're like it's low, like um, not, like low effort, low value because all this stuff is probably automated and they're just yep. probably like let's make this money printing machine and Google's like, yeah. you know what? No, no, you're not adding That's anything. exactly my guess, that Google has basically ranked it lower because it doesn't actually add value. And it's like, it's and it's easy to see when you go to these sites, if you understand a certain category, right? Like Sarah understands water bottles. Yeah. She has a lot of water bottles and has a favorite one. And there's a reason why, because you, you know a lot about it, right? Same thing. Well, this one right here, right? Remember this kettle right here was one of my not nulls. It literally right. broke on me. It literally, yeah. after I spent a fortune on this thing, almost $200 on it. And the thing broke. It was literally one of my not knows. And it's in their top five list. Like, yeah. it just makes me think that they don't really understand it because they haven't really used it. It's just one that's expensive. Kettles. They matter. just pick five. And the expensive ones, the, none of these are cheap <laughs> because the, more, the higher the price of the item, the more affiliate money they make back. So they just pick the most expensive items to affiliate. And that's it. Yeah. And so sometimes I'll read like, I think it's like PC Magazine does reviews on certain things, you know, or Tom's yep. Hardware does reviews. And I'll look at a site that you feel like at least they so, tried to review them. None of these are reviews. Or like a real yeah. person is behind. Well, yeah. like the, well, we know they're not because they've been caught with AI versions of it. So we yeah. know they're not real reviews. They're just ads. <laughs> yeah. It's just exactly. an ad. It's an ad in disguise. It's just ads. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Um, but there, this br does bring up a bigger, interesting point because this is something that I see a lot of like companies are doing. And if someone says that that's not something they're exploring, I'm like, mm, I don't know, because you can't compete in today's like SEO market if you are not able to pump out enough of like, and it has to be good content. Mm -hmm. But we could argue if it's like AI generated or human uh written but the way and i think google has to figure this out because right now ai i feel like is breaking the algorithm because um there's many times when on a website where i think it's the answer but when i look at the article it's very poorly written and you could tell it's written by chat gpt so there's this idea of like programmatic seo where you automate your seo process to be able to have organic traffic to your website and i'm kind of like 50 50 because to me Number one, it's like, I mean, I enjoy writing. I like write articles, but at the same time, in, so, in terms of like staying competitive and if you, the content that is being created provides value and answer like a genuine question that someone has, that makes sense. Like for instance, I'll, I'll give you like some examples. Like for me, for instance, I love writing technical articles where I show you how to build something. But sometimes people ask me like, Paul, like what framework do you think is better? Is it React? Is it Next.js? Like I actually don't want to write about that. But it's a valuable like answer people are searching for. So I don't mind having AI like take a bunch of notes that I have and create the answer based on my notes that I gave. And I will be not feeling guilty at all because number one, I'm providing the value that people want to see. It's, hey, which framework, what are the things that you think? It's nice and organized. And it's, again, something that I don't have to make because now I could work on more of the articles that I like to write, more technical stuff. So I think if done correctly, there's a value. But at the same time, there are so many examples. There's a technical site. I'm not going to tell them by name. What they did is they scraped every other like website that like documentation, like regardless of like Next.js docs or like some other like framework docs. And then they basically rewrote their own version of docs. And whenever you write, like ask a specific question, how do you do something Next.js? They steal some of that traffic. So instead of having Next.js docs comes up, this random website comes up where they just scrape the data and publish their own version of the article. And I think that's messed up because like Google needs to create like or improve algorithm where whatever your site is and you're known for that authority, that should be taken into consideration. So for instance, like if I'm Nike and I wrote like article about like Nikes, I'm just guessing this how ideally I think it will work. Maybe I should get some more weight before being like a valid response. But at the same time, like, I feel like that becomes like very authoritarian. It's, cool <laughs> it's like, yeah. so, so it's like, how do you balance that? You know? Well, I think, um, in a weird way, I think Google and all of it, well, specifically Google doesn't want to send you to a website any longer. They just want you to look at the AI review. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think and, that's part of the reason the traffic drops too. Yeah. I think part and of I the reason Paul said, and this is going to be AI. the death of what we know as the internet today, like that. 
what's next? I don't know. Something will replace it, but um, maybe it's websites. I mean, like these kind of websites don't add value. You can just, they can generate a five person. Hey, which kettle should I buy? They can give you five of them. Uh, they will. If you ask it. Yeah. yeah. The AI will. And, and they won't there's be a any big, order. They'll just rank them. But you know, I was going to say, there's a big issue with this because um, like, for instance, you said, Google, they don't want to send you to the website. They just want to give you the answer. But where are they getting the answer? They uh, scraped your website. They took the right. data and they put. And so yeah. every other AI company is doing it. And I think it's very egregious because people either going to stop creating websites they or will. stop creating content or it's like make the system better. And this is why I like perplexity AI, where they give you the reference where the data came from. And to me, I feel like that's like the best of both worlds. You're uh, creating some value that allows me to have useful search, but at the same time, you show me the original article where at, at least I have a choice to go there. And I think like if that article that says has a service or affiliate link, even though you used because you scraped that data and you're showing it through your AI chat, I think the original author or the creator should get some sort of recognition or compensation. You can't just take other people's work. Uh, that's like my biggest issue with AI and say that it's your own because it's showing up on your website. Um, well, I think the social contract between creators and the big tech people serving up, and if it could be YouTube, it could be Twitter or whatever, has been broken. They said, hey, make content, we'll pay you. And if you look at YouTube, man, it's like, it doesn't matter how many views you get. You got to have something else. You're not going to make money on just ad re revenue. No. In fact, here's what I propose. I think every creator should turn off, and we had this discussion yesterday, Kevin, turn off mid-roll ads as a protest on all of your YouTube content. If I could make a totally ad-free channel, I absolutely would say, don't yeah. pay me anything. You're not paying me anything anyway, so I'm just not going to run right. ads. And then um, I think it's not even an option, though. We no, it's not yeah. an option. We're like, can we either do that? The, We're like, no. Either the ads that run <laughs> pay Google or yeah, either or the you. ads that run pay you. Like, they yep. can't. Yep, not an option. Y yeah, Which you have to have them. And so, you know, if there was another platform that had the same kind of traffic they do and then could pay creators, it, but I think they would initially renege too once they got so big. And I think that's what you're seeing. They're just not telling you how much they're not paying you because right. like, I mean, you know, you should make more than six cents if you have, you know, 10,000 views on a video. So right. I figured out a system. I didn't figure out other people do it <laughs> uh, and it's fine. So I started making tutorial videos on YouTube, but I'm like, I need to have a clever way of capturing emails of my coding after uh, mm -hmm. 30.com website. And basically like you watch the video on YouTube, but it has class notes in the link. When you click the class note links, it navigates people back to my website. And if you want to see the notes, you got to put in your email. Nice. So I'm like, okay, how can I take traffic from YouTube and start building my own yeah, list of people? I like that idea. Uh, but I, I do that. give them free option where, I mean, everything is free. But I sure. give them an option. If you don't want yeah. to share your email with me, you could just use this dummy account that I have and see the notes anyway. They can use Proton Mail anyway. I mean, like, yeah. you know, they are, the, the, <laughs> right. Well, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. We've but, certainly had a similar system for a long, long, long time. We've had yeah. the job roadmap through Code of Foundry, where it's yeah. like it's just a link that you go to and you you get something for it, yeah. but yeah. you do get put on the mailing list too. But yeah. Like, you know, right. not think, that we, yeah. we don't send a lot to the mailing list, but you know, you're on it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I These... think it's only only fair because there's taking your content and repurposing as their own through all their AI models. I think we should <laughs> be able to take and get ownership of our, you know, uh, viewers. Yeah, 100%. yeah. These sites uh, offend me on a personal level because. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Just, She's just shaking her fist in the sky. <laughs> Reviewed. <laughs> no, just because like I take a lot of pride in what I review. Like I won't accept any sponsored reviews of stuff that like I won't actually use myself and things like that. And so like I try and build a lot of trust with my audience and like, okay, if I'm really saying that this is good, then like you can believe me that this is good. And these sites, like I can't compete with that, you know, where they're churning out so much content. I can't test five kettles you know, over and over again. Well, they can't either. They're just They're saying not either. They <laughs> right. But I'm AI, saying AI people generated. are thinking that they yes, are. they are thinking that, yes. You know, true. and yep. so it's hard for somebody like me to compete with that when they can turn out so much more content than I can, yeah. even though their content is crap. 
But like, how are people going to find me like an actual trusted resource? I'm wondering if the affiliate program for Amazon has has figured this out too. And they're like, we're not Mm. paying for this link, this pastor. Right? Yeah. Makes sense. Probably. They should do that. Because for me, like the best reviews I get is you see like this person and they look like they had a rough day and they're just like, (laughs) ah, what a terrible day I had. And then... And then they tell you about like the thing and you like feel that human connection. It's like, I could trust this person. They did not like check on my bill. Like, and, and because there's something <laughs> real about it. And, uh, and I appreciate that. So a lot of the reviews, if I do want to find one, even on Amazon, like if the review was like, I bought it, it's great. I'm like, that doesn't help me at all. Like what yeah. the hell did I learn from it? I just recently bought a product, um, where I read the review and literally starts not the best product ever, but I give it four stars because A, B, C, D, it still sucks in this department. I was like, you know, that, that is like a very balanced real review. And like, yep. I got the thing and it literally like matched exactly what they said there. I was so excited <laughs> because like, that's exactly what I was expecting. It wasn't like, and, yeah. and I respect this brand now because I got a review that actually matches like the outcome of like what I expected. Where there's times where you read the, like, I remember on Amazon, I read a review, I got the thing and I was like, this was a complete lie. I just got scammed. This is BS. And I'm never, ever buying anything from them ever again. The whole review game is just kind of, it's a problem, isn't it? Because it's so fake. And you know that when you get an item and it's like, and you've seen it has 10 out of 10 reviews and you're like, you get it and like, there's no way on this planet is this a 10 out of 10 to anybody. I don't care where you come from, what you do, but there is no way this is a 10 out of 10 item. It's just not. So therefore, one of two things, either it's fake, which is the most likely answer, or the person like reviewing it literally has no clue what they're talking about <laughs> and or, or they've been paid or something. It's just, right. it's not, it's not real. And that's the whole review game, isn't it? It's just, it's, it's, it's a problem. It's, it's, you have to almost like discard the tens, discard the ones and look for those ones in the middle. To find out like what the real truth is, which is what yours was for. Your four out of five is a yeah. is a middling review that's like going to give you the actual truth. Hey, so in better news, AI things that shouldn't be in products is <laughs> AI TVs are coming out, and so now they're literally shoving AI into everything. Um, so the new Samsung TVs, and I'm sure it's going to be in LGs. I'm sure it's going to be in Sony's and Bravios and everything else on the sun. But we've got three features in here. One's 8k upscaling so i don't know if you guys watch television or watch movies or if you have a home theater i do i've spent a lot of money in my home theater and so the way the movie looks the way it sounds is important and that's why i've bought a leg LED tv because i think it looks better but upscaling with ai looks like crap it always has <laughs> and it always no will. this is a feature bobby what are you talking about <laughs> you know this is ai upscaling this is so different especially upscaling in sports in general has always been crap like yeah. way back when it's always been crap have you heard like how i think they redid a bunch of movies like alien and true lies where they use like ai upscaling and you literally like in certain scene see like ai hallucination where the faces look like they're phasing <laughs> in and out in reality because they surprise. just were too lazy to actually do themselves and so or they like look very uncanny and i think that yeah it's funny how they just yeah so where's this going i mean where's this going is this going to happen like one day i'm watching the san francisco 49ers play my raiders right sarah's a, she's a 49ers fan we watch the same game but my team wins when i watch it her team wins and she watches it because of AI. It's the ever-pleasing AI. It knows who you want to win. <laughs> it's the yes man. Like I said earlier, AI and then we is the argue ultimate who yes won man. the game. Where do I <laughs> buy that TV? Where do I buy that TV? Like, you know, I, said this before. I already said this before. Like, you know, sometimes like I, I'm a big fan of like Star Trek, the next generation, but that right. shows like, kind of, you know, it's not aging well, but like the effects wouldn't be cool. You have this AI overlay. NVIDIA, do something useful. Make this thing happen, you know, rather than talking about <laughs> taking developer jobs where you literally say, you know, I want this chip to look like this or like in the cyberpunk side, it just automatically does it. That I would pay money for. Build useful things with AI. Come on. Now, now the, I'll go through a little bit of review of this. The other thing that I don't like it is, is AI, well, motion enhancer for a ball going through the air. Kevin, Kevin's a big soccer or, you know, football fan, whatever you want to call it. This is terrible. Don't do this to the ball. Like, well, you know? this is just this. I mean, okay. So this is an extension of what happens right now, right? When you yeah. buy a TV, and we've been buying these for the past 
I don't know, at least it's been in TVs for the yeah. last probably even decade, even maybe a little bit less than that. But there's this thing like motion smoothing, motion, whatever you want to call it. It's Turn on it TVs off. right now, right? right? This is just the 8K version of that or the AI version of that. It's the same thing. First thing I do when I get a new TV, I turn that off. <laughs> it is yeah. the worst feature. So all it does is it takes this frame and this frame and it says, oh, I can shove more frames in the middle there. Mm-hmm. And it makes them up. And it's not real. And that's where you get that soap opera effect, right? Yeah. On TV. Yeah. Some people love it. I oh, hate it. Oh, I hate that. No, it needs <laughs> to have some softness to it. You know, like, you know, you don't you don't need a like a crystal clear fake image. Right. The worst feature though, let me give you the worst feature is the sound. So like <laughs> yeah. this is the worst thing ever. So like I don't know if you've ever turned vocal enhancer on. Oh, now, God. if you if you're hard of hearing, like my parents are, and if you're listening, sorry, mom and dad, you know. <laughs> They turn this on because when they hear a movie, they can't hear the voices anymore. And so they turn it up louder, but then the background gets louder. In that case, this does work. But in general, if you're watching Furiosa or Mad Max or anything like that, and you turn this on, I am walking out of that living room. (laughs) We're not watching it that way. It's terrible. Like, you know, like suddenly the music was intended to invoke emotion is like way in the background. And then like, the special effects are way in the background. And then you, all you hear is the people yelling at you from, from front of the screen. You're just like, that's, you know, that's not what it sounds like. You know, there actually is a plane in the background. You know, it doesn't need to be pushed way in the back. I would turn this off too. I think this is really bad. And then the other one is the made up surround sound, which oh, is the man. next feature down there where they're saying, Hey, you could hear this movie and you can hear what the character would hear in the movie. And it's like, well, no, the movie was cut with 7.1 and it, these things are placed for a reason and they spent, you know, $20 million doing it. So why would you change it? Samsung, you know better than So does this no add one? in actual fake no. sounds or does it take sounds that are in the original mix it's and trying just to move trying to place them. them. Okay. I don't like, think, you know, I don't know. I haven't heard it yet, but just saying that. It's, there's no it's, way it knows though, it's right? It's changing the mix. So what's interesting to me is like one of the big problems that, and and I have a huge problem with um, services that were like VidAngel, right? So like VidAngel goes through (laughs) and like takes out the like bad stuff, right? Like, and I'm a religious person, but I I like Deadpool just like the other person, right? (laughs) So um, I have been always against products like VidAngels. I'm like, that is not the product that, the creators created right Right. like you are changing it and now it's not their their work right like it's completely different than what their vision was their creative person wouldn't this be the same kind of thing like where this isn't their work like i don't understand how hollywood could even like be on board with this and well, that's because they want to replace actors completely, so they don't <laughs> have anybody money. When you talk about it. Of well, course, they know too. what they're doing. The <laughs> issue, yeah, exactly to your point, uh, Sarah. Like I was going to say, is that it becomes like you're literally living in a mat- matrix because everything digital media or anything you interact with somehow either enhance or in the future is going to be completely replaced. Like one ad I saw on Instagram, I don't know why I'm still on Instagram, where it's literally a photo thing where it makes you look fit. I'm like, I don't want to sure. look fit. I want to actually be I'm fit. Be like, fit. I'm like, like, check out my picture with the six pack I got. It's like, I look at the mirror and it's like, I don't have a six pack in real life. Like, what the hell's going on? No, it's like, 8K so, upscaling. It, there we go. Upscale, you know what I'm saying? Like, make it look better. But the point is like, but you're not better. Right. Like, you're still the same person. It's like, and so like, I think like we need to keep reality for what it is so we could enjoy like, and this is why I think like at some point this is going to get tiresome because like we're going to as human beings we're going to know that okay this is highly and I, maybe like i'm being too optimistic be like this is highly unnatural because it's perfect in every possible way and yes. sometimes like the imperfections is what makes us who we are and yes. to me like i want to like l- live with like in reality and what was one interesting thing i had like surgery and like i got this bad scar that's starting to look better um but I'm like, this is me now. Like, what am I going to Photoshop it out of all the pictures? I'm like, no, but that's not me. Like, I want to have true representation of like people and reality that I see. And I'm kind of interested in the future if we're going to have like this divide, like people that just want to be real. It probably will because it's in every cyber, like 
you know, sci-fi movie where there's people that want to hold to the old ways. And then there's like augmented <laughs> superhumans that never age and like whatever. So maybe that's what's going to happen. But to me, I think there's something interesting about being different through imperfection and through like reality then yeah, yeah. i was gonna say something less profound and like i don't <laughs> want ak upscaling i want actual 4k bar casts of every nfl game they make enough money they should be required to broadcast every single no, one of them in 4K. Th- this, this is true we haven't even got 4k uh, <laughs> broadcast like, stuff yet for, yeah. ed- for loads of stuff yeah and so now so, you like, want to take a a 2k broadcast at best or maybe a 1080 and upscale it to 8k just stop doing what you're doing it's not gonna look good i want a 4k broadcast of every nfl game this year i think i I pay enough for my sunday ticket that they (laughs) could upgrade the cameras in the production and the streaming whatever you got to do on the other end from the truck i think you could upgrade it i don't think it's that big of a deal well, thanks everybody for hanging around till the end and watching this episode of the Not No Podcast. A couple of things I could ask you to do if you could let a friend know about the podcast or a stranger, that works too. You can also leave us a rating and a review Mortal wherever enemy. you listen to your podcast. AI bot. <laughs> right. Anybody, we'll take anybody. Um, if you're watching us on YouTube, give us a thumbs up and subscribe to get notifications of new episodes. And you can also send us a communication. You can email us or you can text us. Where can they send that email to, Sarah? The Not Null Podcast at AOL.com. That's it. And your text can go to a link down in the description and you can send us a text message. We can't respond, but we'll, we'll get the message <laughs> and we maybe read it out. And we'll see everybody next week. A whisper in the No more deaths.